Humans are fascinated by gore and violence, but even more so the mysterious and unsolved. This interest in disturbing and unpleasant subjects is called morbid curiosity, and it has gripped hundreds of people throughout the ages. I am one of those people. My name is Hallie, and this is the Morbid Curiosity Podcast. This episode was suggested by a listener, Mike. If you'd like to suggest a topic, you can find us on Twitter at Morbid Podcast and Facebook and Instagram at Morbid Curiosity Podcast. There are two things that come to mind when I hear the name The Elephant Man. One is the 1980 film and the other is the rumor that Michael Jackson tried to buy his skeleton, which is false, by the way. I knew the Elephant Man was a man who was a severely disfigured medical curiosity near the end of the Victorian period in England. But by the end of the research I did for this episode, I learned that the man was named Joseph Merrick, and he was so much more than a medical oddity. Before I go into detail on the actual medical condition that affected Joseph Merrick, I want to tell you about his life. That way, you can know the man, Joseph Merrick, and not just his disease. On August 5, 1862, a child was born to Mary Jane and J.R. Merrick in Leicester, England. The baby boy was healthy, which was a relief to Mary as she herself suffered from some physical disabilities. Overjoyed, the new parents named the baby Joseph Carey Merrick. The couple went on to have three more children, but it seemed their luck had run out. John Thomas died of smallpox before the end of the year of his birth. William Arthur died of scarlet fever at the age of four. And Marion Eliza, who was born with the same physical disabilities as her mother, died of myelitis an infection and inflammation of the spinal cord, at the age of 24. Joseph, who had seemed so healthy, soon developed a swelling on his lip and a bony lump on his forehead. Around the age of five, he started to display more strange symptoms. His skin grew thick, lumpy and grayish, almost like that of an elephant. As he grew, his right arm seemed to swell and grow, and his feet became enlarged. Doctors at the time theorized that the symptoms were the result of maternal impression, meaning that the emotional experiences of a pregnant woman could affect their unborn children. This, of course, is false, but it was a concept still common in England at the time. In Mary's case, the physical abnormalities of her child were the result of her being frightened by an elephant at a fair while she was pregnant with Joseph. On top of his deformities, during his childhood Joseph fell, injuring his left hip. Due to infection, he was left permanently lame. Despite all his physical deformities, Joseph attended school and remained close to his mother Mary. Sadly, in 1873, when Joseph was just 11 years old, his mother died of bronchopneumonia. J.R. Merrick and his children moved into the house of Mrs. Emma Antill, a widow who also had children. J.R. Merrick married Emma the next year. By the age of 13, Joseph Merrick's life at home was miserable, as neither his father nor stepmother showed him any affection whatsoever. He ran away several times, but was always brought back by his father. He left school to work in a cigar factory, but three years into the job, his right-hand deformity worsened, and he lost the dexterity required for his work. He spent his days wandering the streets, trying to find work and steering clear of his stepmother and her constant taunting. Seeing Merrick as a financial burden, his father got Merrick a hawker's license, which granted him the right to sell things door to door. Merrick attempted to sell haberdashery items from his father's shop in this manner, 
but was unsuccessful due to his deformities and the fact that his speech was increasingly difficult to understand. Housewives refused to open their doors to him. People began to stare and follow him around out of curiosity. In 1877, Merrick's father beat him severely for being unable to support himself. Soon after the beating, Merrick left home for good. Now homeless, Joseph Merrick wandered the streets of Leicester. His uncle, a barber named Charles Merrick, went looking for him and offered him a place to stay. Merrick accepted and continued to try and sell things door to door, but was met with the same fear and horror as before. Eventually, his deformities drew so much negative attention that the Commissioner for Hackney Carriages, for which Merrick worked as a carriage driver, withdrew his license. Charles Merrick was no longer able to support his nephew, and at the end of 1879, Joseph Merrick entered the workhouse at the age of 17. A workhouse is a place where those who are unable to support themselves went to live and work. Life in the workhouse tended to be harsh. These were places where the poor, the elderly, and the infirm and sickly were put to be forgotten. Merrick became one of about a thousand residents in the Leicester Union workhouse. The inmates were segregated by age and sex, placing Merrick in a group of men aged 16 to 60. Twelve weeks after entering, Merrick tried to get out of the workhouse by finding real work, but had to return when he found nothing. For four long years he lived in the workhouse. During that time, the protrusion on his mouth swelled to around eight and a half inches, inhibiting his ability to speak and eat. In 1882, he underwent surgery at the Leicester Infirmary and had part of the mass removed. Surgery at this time was almost as dangerous as injury. Though anesthesia had been introduced in the early 1800s, antiseptic was not commonly used. Infection after surgery was rampant, making any procedure dangerous, and most patients only opted for surgery as a last resort. Thankfully, Merrick avoided infection, but even after his surgery, he worried he would never escape the workhouse. He concluded his only way to earn a living might be through human novelty exhibition, a polite term for the freak show. Merrick approached a local Leicester Music Hall proprietor, Sam Tor, with this idea. Tor decided there was a lot of money in exhibiting Merrick, but to retain the novelty of his deformities, the exhibit would have to be a traveling one. Tor organized a management team for Merrick, made up of a music hall proprietor, Jay Ellis, traveling showman, George Hitchcock, and fair owner, Sam Roper. That August, Merrick finally left the workhouse to set out on his new career path. Hitchcock gave Merrick the name The Elephant Man and advertised him as a half-man, half-elephant. Merrick was exhibited around the East Midlands of England, including Leicester and Nottingham, before the group finally made it to London. There, he was set up in the East End as a human curiosity. At first, Hitchcock worried Merrick's deformities might be too horrific for the London crowd but the shop on Whitechapel Road, where the exhibit took place, was often full of curious onlookers. Many who came to see Merrick were visibly horrified when they saw him up close, but the advertiser of the show often explained that the Elephant Man was not here to frighten, but to enlighten. Most of the money they made was due to sales of a pamphlet titled The Autobiography of Joseph Carey Merrick, which outlined Merrick's life to date. The pamphlet was generally accurate, though it is not known if Merrick actually wrote it himself. Money came in steadily thanks to the location of the exhibit right across the street from the London Hospital. Medical students and doctors visited often, curious to observe this strange medical condition. And eventually, Merrick drew the attention of a surgeon named Frederick Treves. 
Treves wrote that Merrick was the most disgusting specimen of humanity that he had ever seen. When he met him, Treves asked Merrick to the hospital for an examination, and Merrick agreed. To avoid unwanted attention, Merrick wore a costume that covered his whole body, including his face, and took a cab which was hired by Treves. At the hospital, Treves observed that Merrick as a person was shy, confused, and not a little frightened, and oppressed. Because of this, Treves assumed Merrick was an imbecile. During the physical examination, Treves noted papillomata, or wart-like growths, the differences in the size between Merrick's right and left arms, the looseness of the skin, bone deformities in the right arm, both legs, and the skull. A pungent odor also accompanied these deformities. Despite the corrective surgery on his mouth, Merrick was still barely intelligible when he spoke. Apart from these deformities, however, Merrick was in good health. While in London, Merrick returned to the hospital several times, and during one of these visits, Treves took photographs and gave Merrick copies which were later added to his pamphlets. Treves went as far as to present Merrick at a meeting of the Pathological Society of London. Eventually, Merrick stopped going to the examinations at the hospital. He said he was often stripped naked and felt like an animal in a cattle market. At this time, tastes were changing in Victorian Britain. Freak shows were becoming more of a cause for concern than entertainment. They were thought to be indecent and caused disruptions due to crowds. Not long after Merrick's last examination with Treves, the police closed down the show on Whitechapel Road. In 1885, Merrick joined his manager Sam Roper's traveling fair. There, he befriended two of his fellow performers, Bertram Dooley and Harry Bramley, who in the fair were called Roper's Midgets. His two friends often defended him from public harassment. Despite the dissipating enthusiasm for freak shows, Merrick remained a popular spectacle. However, as the police began to shut freak shows down, Roper grew nervous for he and Merrick's show. They decided to go on tour in Europe with the hope that the authorities would be more lenient. They were not. The Elephant Man tour was no more successful in continental Europe than it had been in London, and the authorities took similar action in forcing them on their way. In Brussels, Merrick was deserted by his European manager, who also stole all of Merrick's savings, a total of 50 pounds which in 2016 is the equivalent of 4,900 pounds, or $6,175. Alone and abandoned, Merrick made his way by train to Ostend, Belgium, where he tried to take a ferry to Dover, England, but was denied passage. He then went to Antwerp and found passage on a ship to Essex, England. From there, he was able to get back to London. But when he arrived at Liverpool Street Station on June 24, 1886, he had nowhere to go. He approached strangers for help, but his appearance was so repulsive to them and his speech so unintelligible, no one moved to help him. He did, however, draw a group of curious onlookers. A policeman approached and, seeing the cause of the commotion, helped Merrick into an empty waiting room. Merrick huddled there in the corner, exhausted and terrified. Unable to communicate, he held out the only identifying thing he had on him, Dr. Frederick Treves' business card. The police contacted Treves, who went to the station and took Merrick by cab to the London hospital. Merrick was admitted, washed, fed, and treated for bronchitis. A room was made for him in a small isolation room in the attic of the hospital, where he would live for some time. Soon after he arrived, Treves made a thorough examination of Merrick. His condition was far worse than before. The deformities were slowly crippling Merrick. 
Treves suspected Merrick had also developed a heart condition and worried he would live only a few years more. But as time passed in the care of the hospital, Merrick's health began to improve. The people who cared for him became accustomed to his deformities and no longer shrunk away with fear. Frequent bathing alleviated the problem of his unpleasant smell. With the knowledge that Merrick would need housing and care for the rest of his life, Treves sought aid from Carr Gom, the chairman of the hospital committee. Gom, in turn, wrote a letter to the Times newspaper telling about Merrick's case and asking for public opinion on what the hospital should do. The public responded with donations and letters, all in support of letting Merrick stay at the hospital. With financial backing secured, Merrick was guaranteed a place for life and was moved to a two-room suite in the basement of the hospital, next to a small courtyard. The rooms were furnished and adapted to suit Merrick personally. During his time living at the hospital, many things changed for Merrick. Treves was able to conduct a more thorough examination and through time spent with Merrick, learned to understand his speech and for the first time, Merrick was able to have a lengthy conversation with another person. Treves and Merrick spent a few hours together every day and grew to be friends, though Merrick never completely confided in him. Merrick was reluctant to speak of his own childhood or his exhibition days, though he was thankful to his former managers. Treves observed that Merrick was a sensitive person and showed his emotions openly. He also demonstrated many of the characteristic signs of depression and was often bored or lonely. Also, Merrick had spent the majority of his life segregated away from women, who were either disgusted or terrified when they met him. Treves decided to introduce Merrick to a woman in order to help him feel more normal. He brought his friend, a young widow named Layla Maturin, to visit Merrick, giving her warning of Merrick's appearance beforehand. After their short visit, Merrick was overcome with emotion. Maturin had been the first woman to smile at him. The two kept in contact by letter, and the friendship inspired a quiet confidence in Merrick. Despite this happier life, Merrick was still curious about what he called the real world. He often spoke to Treves of his desire to see a real house, and so Treves brought Merrick to his own townhouse and introduced him to his wife. After this, Merrick returned to the hospital and took up the hobby of building models of houses out of cardstock. He passed his days reading, building his models, receiving visits from hospital staff and taking daily strolls in the courtyard after dark. Because of the letter that Gom had written to the Times, London's high society took notice of Merrick. One person who was particularly interested was Madge Kendall, an actress best known for her roles in Shakespeare plays. Kendall raised public sympathy and funds for Merrick and sent him signed photographs of her and other gifts. Other members of high society also visited and brought gifts, like books and photographs, and Merrick reciprocated with letters and handmade models. He met the Princess of Wales and received a Christmas card from her every year after. Merrick enjoyed these visits and soon began to converse with people who passed by his window. He even began to wander the hospital but was often rushed back to his room by nurses who were afraid his presence might frighten other patients. Three times Merrick left the hospital to holiday in the country. Through precise arrangements, Merrick was able to board a train unseen and have an entire compartment to himself. He went to Northamptonshire to stay at Fossley Hall, a grand Tudor house surrounded by gardens and parkland where he spent his time walking in the woods, collecting wildflowers, and finding friends among the locals. Four years passed, and Merrick's condition continued to deteriorate. 
Eventually, he was completely confined to his bed. On April 11th, 1890, he was found dead in that bed, his deformities having asphyxiated him. During the autopsy, it was found that the weight of Merrick's head had dislocated his neck. Knowing that Merrick had always slept sitting up due to the weight of his deformity, Trees guessed that Merrick had attempted to sleep like normal people do, and died. Through his grief, Treves made a plaster cast of Merrick's head and limbs, took skin samples, and after dissection, articulated Merrick's skeleton, which remains to this day in the pathology collection of the Royal London Hospital. Though Merrick's skeleton is not on public display, there is a small museum dedicated to his life. Treves also published a book called The Elephant Man and Other Reminiscences, in which he went into detail on all he knew of Joseph Merrick, not all of which was accurate, as Merrick never fully confided in him. But still, Joseph Merrick's legacy went on, and still does today. In 1971, an anthropologist, Ashley Montague, published his book, The Elephant Man, A Study in Human Dignity, which drew much from Treves' book and explored Merrick's character further. Ashley pointed out the inconsistencies between the many accounts of those who knew Merrick. However, he also perpetuated some of the errors in Treves' work, such as referring to Merrick as John instead of Joseph. Merrick's life story inspired several works of dramatic art based on the accounts of Treves and Montague. These include the Tony Award-winning play The Elephant Man, a 1980 film also called The Elephant Man, which I highly recommend seeing, and an appearance in the BBC crime drama Ripper Street. The book I used for most of my research on Merrick was The True History of the Elephant Man by Michael Howell and Peter Ford, which was published in 1980. Ford and Howell brought to light much information that was thought to have been lost, such as the details of Merrick's childhood and his exhibition days. This is a good read and I recommend it if you want even more details about Merrick's life. So what was it that made Merrick the way he was? What caused the swellings on his skull, the warping of his limbs, and the roughness of his skin? All his life, Merrick was a curiosity. Yet there is still curiosity and controversy surrounding the cause of his condition. In 1885, Harry Radcliffe Crocker, a dermatologist specializing in skin diseases, proposed that Merrick's condition might be a combination of dermatolysis, pachydermatocella, and some sort of bone disease. In 1909, dermatologist Frederick Parks Weber cited Merrick as an example of Recklinghausen disease, or neurofibromatosis type 1, a tumor disorder caused by the mutation for the genes responsible for cell division. But this was incorrect as Merrick did not exhibit all the symptoms included in neurofibromatosis type 1. In an article of the British Medical Journal in 1986, Michael Cohen and J.A.R. Tibbles hypothesized that Merrick suffered from Proteus syndrome, a rare congenital disorder that causes skin overgrowth and unusual bone development, often accompanied by tumors. Merrick indeed suffered from most of the symptoms of this disease, including macrocephaly, or overlarge head, hyperostosis, or excessive growth of the bones of the skull, hypertrophy, an enlargement of the bone cells, and thickened skin and subcutaneous tissues, particularly in the hands and feet. In 2001, a British teacher and biologist, Paul Spearing, put forth the theory that Merrick may have been affected by a combination of two syndromes. This idea became the basis of a 2003 film called The Curse of the Elephant Man that was produced for the Discovery Health Channel by Natural History New Zealand. Due to the genealogical research done for the film, the BBC was able to trace Merrick's maternal family line 
and found a Leicester resident named Pat Selby, the granddaughter of Merrick's uncle. Her DNA was tested, but these tests were unable to identify what disease may have affected Merrick. Bone and hair samples belonging to Merrick himself were also tested, but the results were inconclusive. Excessive cleaning with bleach, which was part of the preservation process done at the time of Merrick's death, destroyed much of his DNA, making it hard to extract a good sample for testing. Therefore, the cause of Merrick's condition remains unknown to this day. The mystery of this disease and Joseph Merrick's traumatic and often tragic life story are what bring out the curiosity in us. The Morbid Curiosity Podcast was produced by HMS Lloyd. If you want to get in touch or recommend a morbid topic for me to talk about, you can tweet the show at Morbid Podcast or join us on Facebook and Instagram at Morbid Curiosity Podcast. If you like the show, share us with your friends or give us a good rating on iTunes. Your ratings and shares help us find new listeners so we can keep it creepy here on the MCP. My name is Hallie, and until next time, thank you for listening.